The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Good evening and thanks for coming out tonight. I'm Mike Brown, I'm a uh, professor of planetary science here at Caltech and it's my pleasure tonight to introduce your speaker, uh, Jess Adkins. Jess Adkins is a, I always have to read because I always change these things, associate professor of geochemistry and global environmental science here at, Cat at Caltech. And uh, one, one of the very nice things about being a professor at Caltech is that you, you always forget what your friends are and what their titles are and, and, uh, and what they do. And instead you think of them as these people who you know and you, you spend time with and you, you hang out with their family and their kids. And, and uh, I think of Jess as the guy who goes away on boat trips for, for months at a time and, and leaves his family over Christmas and, and then we have to uh, uh, keep his, his wife and his children entertained um, and, and make sure that, that, that they don't get too lonely. Uh, and then every once in a while, you, are, you, you forget that these people also do um, amazing science. And so after, after Jess got back from this trip that you're gonna hear about uh, um, some today, I was, I was reading um, online some article about, about something and I suddenly realized I was reading about this, this voyage that Jess had just been on about looking at the bottom of the, uh, of, of the sea and, and there was this beautiful quote where he's, he's uh, remotely piloting a, a, a something that I'm sure he'll show you across the bottom of the Tasman Sea and that had never been seen before and everybody was silent for 10 minutes staring at this and if you know Jess, you know this is an amazing thing because he was silent for 10 minutes in a row. And, um, but it's, it, as I said, it's, it's, the, it's the pleasurable thing here uh, about being here at Caltech is to have people like Jess as your friend and then also be able to come to a thing like this and hear about some of the amazing things that uh, people around here are doing all the time. And so with that, I uh, give you Jess Adkins. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, thanks to you guys. I'm actually a little bit surprised that there's anybody here in the room since it's April 1st, and I figured this was a big joke. Um, <laughs> so uh, the joke's on you. I didn't actually prepare a talk. I was so convinced that this was true. Um, and then uh, I really was convinced earlier today that it, that it would happen, and so uh, I put this together. Um, I'd like to take you a little bit through a few different threads of the kinds of things that we work on in my group. Um, we're gonna go down into the deep ocean looking for these funny deep sea corals that I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, trying to say something about our climate past with hopefully with some information about what we're uh, gonna be going to in the future. I uh, have a variety of titles as Mike was saying. I, in fact, I'm not entirely sure how my title ended up so long, but one of the really important things about the group that I'm in is I'm part of this, Lin, this newly created Lynn Center for Environmental Science and Engineering. This is a, a fantastic new thing that we have going here at Caltech where a group of us who are, uh, who are oceanographers and atmospheric chemists and geologists um, and engineers are all getting together to work on the climate problem and try, try in a Caltech way fundamentally understand what makes the climate work and what makes climate change via theory and observations. You're gonna see a lot of the observation side here today, but this is something we're really excited about and very grateful to the Lins who just in, in the last year have given a generous uh, gift to help us get going. So what I promise you we're gonna get here. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna see pictures of these deep sea corals of the, these two submersibles, this is Alvin that is a human-occupied vehicle, so three of us get into the ball and go down to the bottom of the ocean. This is Jason, a remotely operated vehicle, so that it actually goes down and we stay back up on a ship and it, it, we drive it like a, a video game from, uh, from a very long tether, kilometers, kilometers long tether. I promise you we'll, we'll get to this point, but we need to think a little bit about just how we're gonna move along, so I thought I'd give you a, a cheat sheet for, for the, the talk here. So this is kind of the flow of what we're gonna do, and, We'll start out at sort of the big scale here with global climate. And 
in a series of steps, work our way down to these very cool little corals that I have right here. There's, in fact, a bunch of them over to the side here, and, and afterwards, you're welcome to come up and, and pick some of them up and, uh, and take a look at them. And so we'll go from the sort of larger scale down to these guys. We'll mess around for a while here uh, and, and look at some things about life at sea and how you actually can pick these up. And then we'll try to come back up via the corals uh, to the big scale again. And, and so that's kind of where we're headed. Overall, I, I hope you pick up on this part of why you should care about the deep ocean. I'm, I'm sure you don't, actually, right now. Um, but uh, hopefully, you'll come away from this thinking a, a little bit more uh, about it. So here's a few slide primer on, on climate change or, or setting climates to begin with. So um, we, we have the climates that we do basically because of this picture. Uh, this is, I like to refer to this as Jess draw. This is about as good as it gets in, in my drawing world. Obviously, the sun isn't the scale with the Earth here. But the main point is that the Earth receives the solar radiation equally um, as if it were a disk in space. But it takes that radiation and spreads it over the sphere such that, and, and you already know this, right, such that the tropics are warmer than the poles. And they're warmer because the energy per unit area is much higher at the tropics than it is up here at the poles. And what that does is set, set up, sets up a planet that's differentially heated. There are two active fluids, the ocean and the atmosphere on the planet, that work very hard to try and equal out that temperature gradient. If, the, if we didn't have those fluids, if the, if the Earth was just a big ball of basalt, it would be much, much hotter at the equator and much, much colder at the poles because we'd only be able to move heat by conduction through the rock instead of the fluids actually act, actively advecting heat from the low latitudes up to the high latitudes in both hemispheres. And so that is what drives our weather patterns, and in the mean, the weather becomes the climate. Uh, as many of you may know, that actually has not been constant in time. And by time here, I'm really going to noodle with the x-axis. It's going to be hard to keep up. I'll try to keep, show you, but uh, with how much we'll go from millions of years down to just a few years uh, over the course of the talk here. But the Earth's orbit actually is not constant around the sun. It has three uh, frequencies at which it varies. There's a 100,000-year frequency, which is the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. So the Earth's orbit is almost circular, but not quite perfectly around the sun. And it kind of goes from rugby ball shape to circular rugby ball to circular with about a 3% difference in the, in the um, two axes of the ellipse with a 100,000-year period. So back and forth, back and forth. And that, of course, changes the distance of the Earth to, uh, uh, to the sun, which then in turn changes the amount of energy received, which is going to change climate. The Earth is tilted over on its rotation axis. And so this is why we have seasons. If we didn't have a tilted Earth, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere would go around the sun and receive the same amount of, of radiation. But because it's tilted over, here's the sun. The northern hemisphere summer is here. That's the southern hemisphere summer, or if you go around like that. That tilt axis oscillates between 21 and 25 degrees or so with a 40,000-year period. And then the Earth wobbles like a top. It processes around that tilt axis with a 20,000-year period. That's the hardest one to get, get your head around. What that does is it changes the phase of the equinoxes. It changes when December 21st, or Northern Hemisphere summer, it, where, it, when that happens, where you are relative to the sun. So today, we're on a relatively close approach to the sun. So Northern Hemisphere winters are actually mild uh, compared to half a precession cycle, or about 10,000 years ago, when December 21st was back out over here, far away from the sun, and so uh, um, uh, northern hemisphere winters were much more intense. So this, this changes the seasonality uh, of the northern and southern hemispheres. And we are in a precessional low right now, even though we're in a generally warm period. Okay, the really cool thing about that celestial mechanics is that it shows up in the ocean sediments and shows up in our, our climate records. Here's today, and here is five million years ago, or 5,000 thousands that, that you see here. The y-axis is the ratio of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 as found in the calcium carbonate shells of organisms that live on, on the seafloor. Um, that's not really so important. The, the key is that if you are lighter, it's a reversed axis. If you have lower numbers, you are warmer and less ice on the planet. And if you have bigger numbers, you're colder and more ice on the planet. And so before about 2.7 million years ago, there was no ice in the northern hemisphere, no permanent ice. There were snow fields, and it snowed, but nothing stuck around to build big glaciers. 
And 2.7 million years ago, right in here, we have the first evidence in the North Atlantic in the sediments of ice rafted detritus, of pieces being weathered off of the continent, being pushed down by ice. And we see that this mean trend towards colder and ice growth is the onset of northern hemisphere glaciation. That's what gives us Greenland and gives us, during glacial periods, three kilometers of ice on top of Canada. That ice uh, makes moraines. It has sort of a conveyor belt of rock that works through it. You know those moraines today as Long Island and Cape Cod, and where, where Woods Hole sits, where I went to graduate school. Those are big piles of rock and, and glacial flour that have been left at the edge of the maximum extent of the ice sheets, as represented by these maxima down here, or these cold periods. The last glacial maximum was 20,000 years ago today, 20,000 years ago, and today we sit up at one of these warm periods. I think you've had a chance to look at this enough to see that it's not just the mean trends, but some very clear changes have, have gone on here. I think you can see that there's an oscillation marching through here. That's the 40,000 year oscillation. That's this. That's the change in the tilt of the Earth's axis. And then somewhere about a million years ago, the glaciers start getting bigger, right? They, they, you get m more ice and you get colder, and they stick around longer. The period increases to 100,000 years, this eccentricity one. We know what paces the ice ages. The, the, this is the Milankovitch hypothesis, so these are the Milankovitch uh, periods. And we're, we know that these are very important in setting when the ice ages happen. We do not know why they happen. In fact, that's still an important open question. But I'll, I'll show you why our field has sort of gotten completely diverted from this question as we've gone on to think about other pieces of the system. This kind of science you could do uh, in, in the 1950s. You could take very long cores and measure uh, the 018, 016 ratio of the calcium carbonate in, in, in shells. In the 80s, we started to get records like this, which are ice core records now from Antarctica, just to sort of give you a sense of, of how the field's sort of moving along. This is today, 400,000 years ago now. So we're looking at four of these intervals in here. We're looking at this period of time right in here as you come in closer towards today. Here is the temperature as recorded by another isotopic system in the ice. And so here is a glacial period, and then it gets warm. You slowly cool, rapidly warm, slowly cool, rapidly warm. This is known as the sawtooth pattern of climate. The last time that it was as warm as it is today was 125,000 years ago. And then the last glacial maximum, again here, at 20,000 years. I hope you've had a chance to see some of the other wiggles on here now. This is the CO2 record. This is one of the great things about the ice cores, unlike the ocean sediments. We actually get to trap some of the atmospheric composition within the ice, and we know what atmospheric CO2 did over these times, and it looks a lot like that temperature record. Here's the interesting thing, though. Now, there, here is the piece of the orbital forcing we think makes the most difference. This is summer insulation in 65 degrees north. That, that, that's uh, June, 65 degrees north. So what, it, what are all those wiggles that I showed you before, the 20, the 40, and the 100K, how do they add up to give you the incident solar radiation in watts per meter squared here, just done as the deviation, so the mean is zero, minus 50, plus 50. And you can see this very smooth sine wave. And I think you can see the 20,000 year period quite clearly, that these are kind of grouped into pairs as the 40,000 year period. And I hope you have a hard time seeing the 100,000 year period in here. And yet it is far and away the strongest signal that we've gotten, both in the marine records here, as we come in towards today, and in the ice cores. This is where CO2 comes in. We would very much like to use the ice cores to try and understand which changed first, temperature or CO2. It's a big question that we have facing us right now in our own climate, in our modern climate system. It's very hard actually to answer that question uh, for some technical reasons about the, uh, about the ice itself. But as best we can tell, the CO2 lags the temperature rise. So when it starts to warm, CO2 still is a little bit low. It lags it by about 400, well, about 800 plus or minus 400 years. So very big error bars on that number. But the cause of coming out of the ice ages is not because CO2 started to go up. However, we cannot have a system with a linear forcing and get this nonlinear response without CO2. And so CO2 is an incredibly important amplifier to the climate system. And these kinds of records are some of the only ways that we know about how CO2 has done that in the past. This is one of the ways that studying the past climate really helps us with the future one. Okay, so we'd like to understand then 
how is it that CO2 varies? And I'm gonna make, in the next two slides, the argument to you that you have to know something about the deep ocean. So here it is, your little primer on oceanography. Um, this, I love this diagram. It's incredibly confusing usually, but, uh, <laughs> but there we go. So let's see, here's the surface of the ocean down to 1,000 meters and then at one scale and then extending the rest of the way down to 6,000 meters. We can see uh, here that you start at 60 degrees north and head down across the equator in the Atlantic looking at all of the, the temperature variability from the surface all the way down to the bottom and on past the tip of South America into the Southern Ocean and then we come back up the planet but instead of doing it in the Atlantic Basin, we do it in the Pacific Basin. So that's how we end up with 30,000 uh, kilometers down here uh, uh, on a planet that, that doesn't have that kind of radius, right? Um, uh, just by going down the Atlantic and back up the Pacific. This is temperature and this is salinity, the two variables that control the density of the ocean, control the dynamic structure of the ocean. The ocean is a big stratified bathtub. The mo most dense waters have to be on the bottom. The less dense waters have to be on the top. Cold is more dense and salty is more dense. And I hope you can see that much of the ocean's interior, much of the deep ocean is filled from the south. These, uh, these, uh, these isolines of temperature outcropping in the surface ocean are showing us the plunging waters, the new deep water formation in the southern hemisphere filling up much of the deep ocean. This only happens in very particular places around Antarctica and so it's quite localized. Here, you don't ever make it across the strong tropical thermocline. It's not the whole story, however. There's salty water formed in the North Atlantic that also plunges down around Greenland. And so we have these two water masses filling the Atlantic, a warm, salty North Atlantic deep water and a cold, fresh Antarctic bottom water. It, you know, this is sort of the Victorian nature of, of science, right? You, you, you see some sort of pattern distribution and you must name it, right? And so this is NEDW, and then you must name it in a way that no one else can understand, right? So that way, that, that way your field stays together, right? And, and no one can invade you, right? Someone more smart can come, can't come from the outside and figure out all your problems. So we call this NADW and AABW, and there's a slight possibility I will lapse into calling those, so I apologize for that ahead of time. So why are you getting this big primer on ocean density and ocean circulation? Because it matters for the carbon. All of the carbon in the, in the ocean atmosphere system, in the climate system, resides in the deep ocean. So this is that same, exact same plot, high latitude north, down into the southern ocean, back up into the Pacific, but now contouring the carbon concentration in the ocean. And you can see that most of the carbon is down here in the deep ocean and less of it is up here in the surface ocean. That's for a very, very good reason. Plants live in the surface ocean because that's where there's light. They take that, they harvest that light via photosynthesis, use carbon around them, fix it into, into their bodies, die and sink into the deep where they redissolve. And so there's a flux of carbon from the surface down to the deep from plants living, dying, and falling down into here. But that's not the only piece, and, and you know, I, I apologize, but I was trained as a chemist, and so you're gonna have to get a one little bit about chemistry across here. The, the first way to think about this, this is an inventory argument for why to care about the deep ocean. So in these units, the PCO2, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, is, uh, is set by its exchange with uh, H2CO3, or carbonic acid. This is the acid in the dissolved inorganic carbon system. And in these units, the carbonic acid would, have a, about, would be about 25. So there's an order of magnitude difference already between the total carbon that's there and the one little piece that actually matters uh, for um, exchange with the atmosphere, uh, the H2CO3. And so overall, there's about 60 times more carbon in the ocean than there is in the atmosphere, and this is basically because the ocean's pH is about eight. It's between 7.1 or, or 7.9 or, or 8.1. So most of the carbon that's dissolved in the ocean doesn't exist in the gaseous form that's in equilibrium, equilibrium with the acid. And most of it exists as bicarbonate, or, or you have it as baking soda in your, uh, in your refrigerators to keep down the, the odors, or as carbonate ion, which is what the corals themselves are made out of. Your can of Coke, right, which is, I hate to tell you, below a pH of about two, um, when you pop that open, right, all the CO2 comes rushing out. That's because it's so acidic. If we were able to take a syringe and titrate in a bunch of base into the side, chemists like to do this stuff, right, uh, titrate it into the side and add base and then pop the top, it wouldn't pop because the CO2 that was in the headspace would dissolve back into the, into the Coke. That's what's going on with the ocean. It's Coke with base added. 
Right? It's pretty close. The, the, the acid is the CO2 in the atmosphere, the base is the rocks around on the land, and the ocean ends up at a pH of about 8. And so as the deep ocean goes, so goes the atmosphere. If we want to understand this curve, we must understand what's going on in the deep ocean. Well, we've known that for a little bit, and in fact, we do have some grip on what's going on in the deep ocean circulation changes. Here's the same sort of plot that I've been showing you already, these sections of the ocean, but now it's just the Atlantic, and I've flipped it around just so you're very confused. So that is the high latitude north. This is the high latitude south. So here's Greenland. Here's Antarctica. The equator just in the Atlantic. And here's that tongue of North Atlantic deep water. Now, instead of showing you the temperature or the salinity or the carbon concentration, I'm showing you the isotopes, the C13, C12 ratio in this calcium carbonate uh, in the ocean itself because that's something that we can reconstruct about the past. We can go to the ocean sediments, find those same calcium carbonate shells, those, the shells of these little animals, these foraminifera, and measure their C13, C12 ratio. But because they're deep in the sediment, we know they're not from today, they're from 20,000 years ago. We can know what, where that level is in the sediment, and we can make the same sort of map for the last glacial maximum. You might be wondering why, how can I get points that are not on the bottom of the ocean? That's because this is a collapsed view of a section of actually an ocean that's 3D and there, there are pimples popping up everywhere. And so you can barely see these white dots. That's actually where seamounts are sticking up or the side of the ocean is there. And so there's sediments at that spot. And I hope you've had a chance to look at this long enough to see that the pa two patterns here are very, very different. The carbon poor North Atlantic deep water dominates the ocean today. The carbon-rich Antarctic bottom water, storing lots of carbon down in a deep ocean, dominates at the last glacial maximum. And in fact, we have enough measurements of this now that we know that when you're warm in interglacials, North Atlantic deep water pushes into the deep. When you're cold, Antarctic bottom water pushes back, and these just oscillate back and forth, sloshing back in the deep ocean, paced in the same way that the glacial cycles are, and paced in the same way that the CO2 changes in the atmosphere. So cool, right? We've been able to sort of put the pieces together. We now know something about glacial and glacial cycles, and it turns out that's not enough. <laughs> um, the whole game changed in the early 90s because of this. This is a piece of the ice core drilled at Greenland's summit. Um, and unlike it, uh, Antarctica, it does not extend back many glacial cycles because it accumulates about 10 times faster than Antarctica does. So you don't get as long a record for the same length pipe, about three kilometers long that you drill into, into the ice cap, but you get a much higher resolution record. And I hope that you can see that there's light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. Those are annual layers in the ice core. And my friend Richard Alley and some of his colleagues have gone back and counted each one of these layers back 40,000 years. Yep, that's a bad job. <laughs> um, and he didn't give it to his graduate students. <laughs> He, and his, he went into the freezers in, in Denver for weeks and weeks on end and went in and 17,771, 17,772. Oh, shoot, where was I, right? <laughs> they had a, moments like that, and they compared notes amongst the three of them and came up with a chronology at unprecedented resolution for what we had in, for that long, 40,000 years, to have annual resolution uh, in a climate record was just fantastic. And the record looked completely different than what we had seen before. And in one sense, it scared our pants off. So here now is today, and here's 140,000 years ago. So now we're looking at just one of those glacial cycles. Here it is where it's relatively warm, 125,000 years ago. Here's that precession cycle and the long, slow cooling into the last glacial maximum, and then that abrupt jump of warming into the Holocene, the last 10,000 years, where climate's been relatively warm and stable. Here is recorded by the ice core. This is also when we, as human civilization, stopped running around and sat down and farmed and wrote down laws and got married and started doing all the things that, that human civilization does. But back at the last glacial maximum and in this whole period, climate was going crazy. And in fact, these oscillations that are something like a half to two-thirds of the whole glacial and glacial amplitude happen in 10 years. And we know that because we can layer count through. We know we, you start here, and in some of these, it's three layers later, you're up here. So what was kind of this cute field for a few academics to go think about for on these 20, 40, 100,000-year timescales, this is a legislative timescale, right? I mean, some of you might remember uh, Strom Thurmond, he lived through several of these things, right? 
it suddenly really matters, is this bad weather over Greenland or is this really global climate that we're seeing here in this ice core? I mean, you can imagine that this is just a weather station and a front is moving back and forth across it and the weather in, in Greenland is terrible, but in London, it's not really changing. This is like going to graduate school in Boston, right? <laughs> in 24 hours, it can change by 40 degrees, right? And, and go from snowing to, to bright and sunny, or sleeting, usually. Um, the question immediately became in the field, and through much of the 90s, this is what uh, my, me and my colleagues were doing, was trying to understand if these wiggles existed in other places besides the poles. The short answer is yes, They're, they've been found in all the major ocean basins, they've been found in terrestrial records, they've been found in both hemispheres. This is indeed a signal of rapid climate change that we completely missed when all we had was this. In the early 90s, this was one of our highest resolution records that we had out of ocean sediments. This is from the Pacific from about 3,000 meters deep, and there's a very good reason that we missed it. Our archive failed us. Climate changed though it will be very interesting in a second to see if the deep ocean changed like this. Climate changed very, very quickly, and our main archive, the marine sediments, didn't get it. And it didn't get it because of worms, right? So what chemists love to rag on biologists, this is where I do it, right? The light, the, the, what is the life history of a worm living in the bottom of the sediment, the benthic organism? Its whole goal is to eat more stuff, and the way it does that is by irrigating the sediment and mixing it up. Well, the first principle of geology is that deeper is older, and if you're a worm and you, you grab something down here and put it on top, that's no longer true. Now, the worm can't grab something that's five million years old down, right? It can't totally mess up the record. It can only smooth it out. It works as a running average. And so take, take with your eye here and just smooth out these high peaks, and I think you'll see that they're the same wiggles in the mean in the ice core that we're seeing up here but up here, we lost all the high frequency variability because the archive failed us. And so if we're going to try to understand that if the deep ocean and CO2 have a role to play on these rapid time scales, we need new archives. So that's this. These are deep sea corals. I'm sure that's a confusing term, right? Corals live in the surface ocean. That's where you want to go on vacation, right? That's you go uh, snorkel amongst the corals. They only have a, a temperature and depth tolerance because they have a symbiotic relationship with algae. They're little plants that live in the tissue of a single coral. The coral itself is an animal. It's the world's most simple animal. It's a polyp. Its mouth and its anus are the same thing. It's stuck to the bottom of the ocean. I mean, it is not a good life, <laughs> right? But some, something's got to live it, I suppose. And in the surface ocean, when you have plants there feeding you dissolved organic carbon, feeding you the fixed carbon they get out of photosynthesis, you grow like gangbusters and make these beautiful, beautiful reefs. If you don't have those and you live 3,000 meters deep in the deep, dark interior of the ocean, you can still eat the food that rains down on top of you, but you grow about an order of magnitude more slowly. And so this five centimeter long D. dianthus grew for something like 50 to 100 years. But it grew with perfect stratigraphy. Right? This is like the ice core. It's not bioturbated at all. That's the great word that we make up to tease the uh, biologist with. It hasn't been mixed in any way by worms living in it. And so older is down here and younger is up here, and we're very confident of that. In addition, they're uranium rich. And so one of the main things we do in, in my lab group over in North Mud is make uranium thorium dates on these. We use the isotopic dating techniques of uranium decaying to thorium to get very accurate absolute ages, and the coral itself provides very accurate uh, relative ages. And so they, it, it's an archive that won't fail us. Here's another example of the kind of deep sea corals that we're after. This is a different one. It's a, this is a solitary coral. There's a single animal that lives in that little cup right there. This is a colonial one, so it has lots of little polyps screwing off of it. This is Erostrata and D. dianthus. So we've got to go find something that's about this big on the bottom of the ocean, <laughs> right? And not the bottom of the ocean, like put on your snorkel and dive down and root around, right? They're going to be anywhere from uh, a few hundred, but we want to go to several thousand meters down. And so that is a hard problem. The, the two places we've gone to look, you might imagine, are in the high, in the North Atlantic and in the Southern Ocean. These are the two places where the water's coming down. We want to get a sense of what is happening at those key deep water formation regions. We went with Alvin in 2003 down into this seamount chain, the New England seamounts. Here are those glacial moraines I was talking about, otherwise known as Long Island and, and Cape Cod. 
Um, and then just in the last, in January, December and January, unfortunately, over Christmas and New Year's, we went into the Southern Ocean. This is the tip of Tasmania. This, this one is actually blown up much more than, than this one. And this is the South Tasman Rise, this acne that you see here, you're gonna see some movies from in, in, a, in a few minutes. We work this whole area. We go to these areas of rough topography and seamounts because they give us the advantage of being able to start at the top and walk down the side, collecting corals from different depths. And that gives us the profile of our tracer. We get to see how did our tracer vary from the shallow down into the deep interior, just in the way that I was showing you that the modern measurements in the water vary as you go from the shallow to the deep. And so we were looking for the, these pimples on the bottom of the ocean everywhere we can to then go down with our deep submergence tools and try to find the corals. So this was our home in 2003. This is the, the first stage in trying to find those corals. This is the RV Atlantis. It has a swath mapping uh, uh, array on its hull that allows us to start making a map. But I have to admit, while this is a beautiful picture, right? Alvin lives inside this garage. You'll see it in, in a minute, the, the man submersible. This is about five stories up here on the bridge. The whole boat is about 272 feet long, just to give you, this is your tax dollars at work right here. <laughs> we have an ocean, a research oceanography program in this country because of a line item from Congress. When I write proposals, I don't have to write in the cost of it. I just say, I want the boat for a month, and can you throw in Alvin also? But I, while I love the picture, I, it really is, it's completely misleading. They only take these sort of money shots on particular days, right? N this is a mill pond, right? This is the Southern Ocean a couple months ago. <laughs> this is a real problem. <laughs> so I, I don't mean to make you sick, uh, but you know, don't start moving around too much. This is shot from the bridge of the Tommy Thompson, the boat that, that looks a lot like the, the, the one I just showed you, where we were in the Southern Ocean, and we just got the snot kicked out of us. Um, uh, there were uh, uh, gales that came through every uh, five days or so. We had, con we had sustained 40 knot winds for 12 hour periods, gusts into the 60s, uh, 10 to 12 meter swells, let alone the chop on top of them. Very hard to find this <laughs> when it's not in a mill pond, right? It's hard enough when it's on the mill pond, right? When you're bouncing around and you can't even deploy, this is a problem. So, uh, uh, we tried to do something about the weather. It turns out, I think you actually can, right? You, this is an old joke, right, that you can't do anything about the weather. Well, we believe that we cursed ourselves in 2003. Uh, we named our cruise the, the Medusa Cruise and, uh, for a very good reason. So here she is, right? And I had brought this amulet that I had gotten in a pawn shop in, in Boston. Don't ask me what I was doing in a pawn shop. Um, <laughs> Uh, for like two bucks, and it had sat on my desk all through graduate school, and it had taken me 10 years to actually get to, to, to this point where we could take Alvin out and go on this cruise, and I thought, of course, I have to bring Medusa along. Well, when you're in the 10th day of those kinds of gales, people start looking for reasons that the weather is so bad. <laughs> and someone saw this, one of, the, one of the mates saw this sitting on my desk and said, what the hell is that thing doing at sea, right? And so we decided that Medusa was the problem. Um, I had good reason to bring Medusa out. I, I, I hope you sort of know the story of Medusa, right? So here are the snakes that make up her hair, and if you looked into Medusa's eyes, you were turned to stone. Perseus, had you, everyone know how Perseus solved this problem? First he had to go capture Pegasus so he could fly to where Medusa, because he had to go kill her. Of course, you gotta go kill the Gorgon, right? What, what else do you do in mythology? Uh, and so he captures Perseus, flies over to where Medusa lives, uses his shield to see her reflection so he's not turned to stone, lops off her head, holds up her head, and the blood that was coming, it's a gory story, <laughs> that's dripping out of, of her, her severed head, drops into the ocean and fossilizes the plants that are there. And Ovid tells us that's the birth of coral. That's where it came from. It was a beautiful little story that I thought was great, and I really loved it all through graduate school, and yet here it was, ruining our chances to find coral. So we decided that we needed to have a little ceremony. I happened to bring Ovid along while we were out at sea, and we decided that a sacrifice was necessary, and so everybody had to don a lock of their hair. Some people were forced to choose different locks than others. We wrapped up all these locks of hairs with the amulet, covered it in a cloth, dipped it in gasoline, lit it on fire, the captain was really unhappy about that part, and slingshot it off the back of the boat, and it worked. <laughs> 
12 hours later, this is what it looked like. It was just fantastic, right? You can change the, I am a very superstitious person when I go to sea. I am not a superstitious person, uh, I don't think at least, maybe ask Tammy later if I am. Uh, but it, I will do anything to make the weather change out at sea, especially get rid of my prized amulet of, of Medusa. And so we are sort of back in business, right? We're able to start using the, our mill pond and our swath mapping tools to try and find this five centimeter tall little coral on the bottom of the ocean. So we do that by first making a map. Here is the summit of Manning Seamount. Uh, this is one of those New England seamounts. This is 1,200 meters deep down to the black parts are deeper than 3,200 meters deep. This is an old volcano. I hope you see that it was circular at one point, but it's failed right here. There's been a big slump event, so this amphitheater that you see here is from a big landslide that's come out of the way. And we really like features like this because they're long ridges that we can come up where we think the corals will be concentrated. Because they're sessile filter feeders, they need to figure out some way to concentrate their food supply. And so if you grow on the top of a volcano that's sticking up in the flow, an extinct volcano, all the water has to come up and over it, bringing the food with it. If you grow up on the rim of that, it's, you're sitting pretty. And so these ridges, the rim around the volcano, these are the places that we wanted to look for the coral. But just to give you a sense of what we're up against, right? here is the view out of an airplane of us right now from 2,500 meters. Right? This is Beckman. We're right here sitting inside this building, and we're looking for this. <laughs> right? Uh-oh, <laughs> we better have really good maps or really good cameras, right? Actually, what we do is we try to get closer. We make those first maps and we go into a nested mode. You take along a fantastic robot. This is the Autonomous Benthic Explorer built at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. This is a totally free swimming uh, autonomous robot that we pre-program ahead of time. It has many, many sensors, but we're chiefly interested in the maps and the photos that it can take. And we have it swim at 40 meters and make a map, and then lower down to five meters and make a photo run. So five meters, we're finally in here. Five meters is what? About up here or so. So imagine yourself floating up above the stage, now looking down for something like this. Maybe, maybe you've got a shot, right? So here's the map that it makes at 40 meters. Each one of these boxes is 100 meters square, and so this map already is much, much more blown up than the one we were looking at before, and these contours, are now five meters each. They were 50 before, right? So imagine you don't know what the seafloor looks like except in the steps of 50 meters and you're looking for something five centimeters tall. Now we know what the seafloor looks like in steps of five meters and we maybe have a shot at finding little scarps and indeed we found coral right here at this X. You mow the lawn here with the, with the autonomous submarine, make the very detailed map and then put the manned submarine, put Alvin or Jason down on top of this stuff and you don't have very far to swim before you start finding the little X's on the bottom. If you use the five meter high runs and put a photo mosaic together, this is what you see on the bottom. It takes a little bit uh, to get used to this, but I think the place to start is over here. These are living deep sea corals. This particular one has its uh, shoulders hunched over and it's got its back to the wind. Here we can tell it's back to the current because of there's winnowed sediment here and we can see how it's striated and the coral is oriented in the same way that the striated sediment is. They're very good physical oceanographers, right? They know how to, how to, how to create turbulence to trap their food. Here's a sponge and another deep sea coral. Th these corals are about this high. The sponge is also about that tall, just to give you a sort of sense. The black next to them is the shadow from the strobe that's being fired. And though you can't tell it, this texture all of these black bits in here are these things. So even at five meters, you actually can't see them, right, uh, and I positively identify them, but you can start to learn what textures to look for in photos like this. And so in this nested way, we work our way down to, uh, to try and find the corals on the seafloor. Of course, none of these tools, making a map or sending down the autonomous submarine, bring them back, and so we need this. This is Jason. This is the remotely operated vehicle. You can see it's tether piled up back here. This is the part of the wire that comes from Jason all the way back up to the boat. It has two arms. Here's one, here's another over here. These are what the pilot control to grab and manipulate things around, grab samples, scoop stuff up, push us off of rocks. Here is where all the samples go. This is a basket that slides in and out. You can see a thruster back here. 
This is the workhorse of the cruise uh, uh, in, in December and January. This right here is a high definition camera. We'll see some of the video footage from there. There's a light bar. Most of the blue that you see is syntactic foam for flotation. It weighs about 9,000 pounds uh, in air. If you had Jason just directly attached to the boat, you'd be in trouble, especially given some of those pictures I showed you, because any time the boat moved up and down, the wire would pull on Jason, and, you would go, uh, and it would go up and down too, and it would be very hard to try and gracefully grab something off the sea floor. That's easily solved with a clump weight. So this is Medea, part of the Jason Medea system. It all comes back to the classics and this stuff. Medea is directly attached to the boat, and it takes up the heave. It takes up the bouncing part of the boat, and then there's a 44-meter long tether that comes from Medea over to Jason, so that when Medea goes up and down, Jason is perfectly still, with a radius of about 40 meters that can, it can move away. You pick Jason up, lower it over the side. I'm being sort of glib about this. This is the moment of truth, <laughs> right? Uh, the hardest part about using these is deploying and recovering them. Can you successfully get it over the side and get it back without damaging it? You lower it over the side, walk into the van, and this is roughly what it looks like. This is the pilot here. Uh, the pilots are unbelievable. They're engineers as well as pilots. They, do, they fix everything about the vehicles as well as drive them around and pick up all your samples for you. And there are 12 monitors that you can see here, and there are another six or so on each side that you can't see here. Most of them are different camera angles around. Some of them are sonar or maps or just data, uh, 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 basic data about how the state of the vehicle. And, and the pilots, this is, they, they feel like they're on the seafloor. Right? It's as if they're in a hologram. They're like Wolf Blitzer during the elections, right? That, 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 uh, that they, feel, they feel the wall behind them as they're driving along. They see the corals that are here and know the thing that's over to the, to the other side. Science, not so much. <laughs> this took a very long time for me to get used to as, as chief scientist on this, is how to stick myself into the world that they get off of the computer screen. It's very hard to take in the information from two computer screens, right? Mike tries to do it every day unsuccessfully. I watch him do it at work, right? Try to do it at a 12 for, tw for 48 hours long while you're on the seafloor. It, that was an incredibly fun part of the cruise, trying to get used to, to that piece of it. And so when you're down there, this is what it looks like. Um, so this is now video footage. It's going to be one of a couple movies that, that, that I'm going to show you. Th this first one is uh, concentrating on trying to find the deep sea corals. And while it's incredibly exciting to be on the bottom of the ocean, for me at least, right? I spent a long time studying the bottom of the ocean to be able to get there. This really stinks, right? No corals here. I know, everybody's looking at the fish, right? That's a real problem. <laughs> here they are, here is the kind of areas that you see, rocky and sandy bottoms, maybe seeing things out in the dark, and it can be very, very frustrating for days on end while you're hunting around trying to find them. The texture is starting to look a little bit better here. Oh no, just another big rock. And then as you lower yourself down over the edge, you start to see this thing right in here, and these things growing on the side. You see we're on the face of this rock now, and there it is. That's the money shot, right? That's Desmophyllum dianthus. That is the living version of this thing growing upside down. It, that one is also about five centimeters tall. Here is another one. Here is a fossil one. This is a very good day <laughs> if you, if, when we find this on the seafloor. So you can even see the polyps waving in the wind there. This is a great day. <laughs> this is at the base of a, of a cliff that we've come up to, about a 50 meter high cliff, and these corals were growing all the way along the cliff. These are now fossil versions. These are old corals. That's just what we're looking for, right? That's how we're gonna do the past climate variability, and the place was littered with them. I think you can see that all the detritus here, except for this urchin, is all of these Desmophyllum dianthus, these deep sea corals, and once you start to get used to where these spots are, find the overhangs, find the little, there was only 50 centimeters of relief to that first one that I showed you, right? Doesn't show up on our maps, but if you can find them, they're there. Here we're lowering ourselves into a crack, so we've just gone down into a crack that's about 103% the width of Jason. It really was an amazing, amazing job. We've dove down about 15 meters into this crack, just scooting, scooting down like this, and that, everything that you see here is a deep sea coral, is a Desmophyllum dianthus. The living ones on the wall, the bottom littered with detritus. This is the best day of the whole cruise. <laughs> 
First of all, it was incredibly exhilarating going down into this crack with Jason. I mean, it's on a tether, right? And we're going overhung under a crack. It may never come home. We're in deep trouble when that's true, right? Then you start to find these places. Everything that you see here is coral. These are these amazing deep reef structures. This is about 1,500 meters deep off of Tasmania. And this is like flying over an, an English garden. This is one of those times where everyone went silent for, for 10 minutes when you just realized that you were in this place of unbelievable beauty and life. And you, I sat there thinking, it's incredible. It's like all the plant life that, uh, that you could see going over to, um, to Huntington. And then, of course, you realize I'm 1,500 meters down. <laughs> Everything here eats. There's not a bit of plant anywhere. Everything here is an animal. In fact, it is a vicious world down here. And we managed to capture some of these sorts of things. This star is working very hard to kill these two things by eating everything around it, these two urchins. There is a vicious competition for food and space. The coral, the dead coral, becomes a fantastic recruitment spot for new living things. And so that's why it's so important for the structuring the communities down there. And it is not the sort of beautiful, benign area Though it is very Seussian. This is, Dr. Seuss saw this stuff before he started illustrating. You'll see some good examples of that as, as we go. Okay, so you find them, right? How do we bring them back? Well, we pick them up with, uh, with the submarine, and we use something like this to help us pick up a lot. This is an, ele we call this an elevator. It's a platform with flotation and two boxes that we send down heavy, we swim over to it with the ROV, put our corals into these boxes, pull the pins on the weights, and it floats back up to the boat with the vehicle on the bottom the whole time. We don't have to come up and down the 3,000 meters in the water column. We just start sending corals home. Bring them up, bring them up, bring them up, bring them up. If you find the sweet spots, <laughs> boy, do you really want to bring them up. So we managed, because of the elevators, to bring up 10,000 of these fossil individuals. That's a lot of U-series dating <laughs> that we're going to have to do. Uh, they're riding the boat home right now. We don't get them until July when it, the boat pulls into Seattle. Um, we found them from about 850 meters down to 2,400 meters down. There are two different species that you see here. And this is basically our scorecard. This is a histogram of where we found corals. We did not find a single living or a single fossil coral below 2,400 meters. But pretty much every time we crossed over 24, 2,300 meters, bang, we started to get them. I, I do not understand why that is true. This is one of these really great things. You go out to sort of go harvest, which is just part one, right, of, uh, of, of the research here. We have to bring, come back to the lab and make a lot of measurements. And yet, already, we've opened up new questions that we don't understand. I'll show you one towards the end of the talk that just blows me away. But here's the basket now. It's had some of the corals taken out. Here we are picking through, getting out new, new corals. They come up in milk crates. The, the really cool biology comes up in these plastic boxes that we try to uh, uh, keep them relatively pristine. The, uh, this is a coral here. This is a, a, a bamboo coral. Um, this is a crinoid, for those of you keeping score at home. It's great when you find a really big one. Everyone's quite happy. Eleni is triumphantly holding a, a large fossil acidid over her head. Nithya is looking on wistfully, wishing she had gotten there first to hold it over her head. You then have a big job of trying to sort through all of these things. We've got buckets and buckets and buckets of the corals, and so we pour them out onto the table. Everyone turns to. It was Christmas while we were out at sea. Everyone turns to to sort them out, and we count every single one of them, trying to make sure we get the right uh, species identification. It, it, it takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to go out to sea for this time. A lot of your tax dollars. We bring back every little bit that we can, except for some of the stuff that... The Solon Similia we didn't bring back so much of. <laughs> uh, but all of this fossil individuals, every little bit of biology gets separated out by whether they're big or by tweezers uh, so that we can pack it up and bring it all home. Here it is being packed up, the individual corals and individual cups. I have some of them over here for you guys to come look at at, uh, at the end of the talk. While we're at sea, we begin processing. So here's Seth cutting off a little piece of, of one of the corals so that we can ha bring back a chunk to begin the dating process before all the corals are, are, are back. The 10,000 of them arrive back uh, in July. We, we walked off the boat with about 300 samples ready to go. There are a variety of other jobs that have to happen at sea and other things that we do. 
it, whenever you go to sea, people are repairing nets, right? That's just what happens. So here, this is the dredge net that Karen is, is sewing up. We took a lot of water samples. This is a rosette. Uh, these long tubes uh, close at, de at depths that we command them to, and so you can get water from the surface or 4,000 meters deep. This is the rosette coming back on board. We were doing a, uh, some other projects out there. This is flame sealing some ampules to trap the gases in the upper ocean, uh, try and look at the sulfur chemistry that's there. There are a variety of good traditions while you're out at sea. Uh, this is the Gumby tradition, where, where these are survival suits, right? It's the Southern Ocean, it's quite cold. They, they're misnamed, you're not really gonna make it if you fall overboard, but if you have one of these on, you've got an, a couple hours at least uh, until the cold takes over. And so everyone must learn how to don these things and everybody looks really silly when, when they do it. Um, there are other sorts of traditions. If you go on your first Alvin dive, when you come out of the ball and you're all excited, uh, your advisor dumps a bunch of freezing cold water over you, sometimes with uh, slime, bio slime inside of it. So this is Alex after his inaugural dive. So the lab group thought that they would start some of their own traditions. I'm in the ball right now. I'm in Alvin while this picture is taking, working, I might add, by the way, trying to pick up corals. And they went and put on all my clothes and started walking around, uh, which they thought was really great. And then someone gave them, they didn't think of this on their own, right? Someone gave them the bright idea to soak them in water and put them in the minus 80 freezer so that my entire wardrobe would be this chunk of ice, right, when I came back out. I, of course, got dunked with the water on, uh, coming up from the first dive. And the joke was on them because I had to walk around in a towel for 24 hours. And that wasn't nice for anybody on board <laughs> while it was all thawing out. So uh, <laughs> there's another tradition that happens at sea, that, uh, which is to take styrofoam cups and squish them. Right? These are, there are different names for these. We called them squishy cups. So this was a styrofoam coffee cup that's been down to 2,000 meters. And all of the air that's inside the styrofoam gets compressed out, and you're left with this little thing. But if you've been at sea too long and you bring around a lot of other styrofoam, things like this start to happen. Uh, I actually don't think it was Medusa, to tell you the truth. That was the problem. What Diego was doing here, I, I really don't know. Nor do I really want to know. But this indeed get, got shrunken. We had lots of shrunken heads around on the boat. You wonder why we had bad weather. Other jobs that we were doing while we were out there, we were trying to keep some corals alive. So this is in an aquarium that we're running on the boat. And you can see that we've been successful with this single polyp <laughs> right here that made everybody very happy. This is maybe the most photographed polyp on the whole ship, uh, that we were actually able to bring some of them off the bottom, quickly get them into the aquarium, and that some of them even recovered. Some of the ones that we started getting better at this as the crews went along are still growing in my colleague's lab in Tasmania uh, as we speak. That's a pretty cool thing. Uh, the biology that you bring up is truly inspiring. So here's a bunch of fossil coral that's had a truffula tree <laughs> sprout off of it. Um, this is a Gorgonian coral. That, 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 that Why it looks so wet and drippy, that's its organic tissue. Here's a polychaete worm, uh, kind of a vicious looking thing. These, these uh, embed into the coral structures. These are the things that you pull out with the tweezers. Here is a soft coral with a single uh, sea star, an ophiroid star wrapped around it. This is one of the most voracious eaters on the seafloor. We saw these things dive bombing mollusk shells that we had just crushed. Um, here is the same sort of thing, but now on a purple bubblegum coral called uh, Paragorgia. Just amazingly beautiful uh, uh, sea life down there. And so I thought you might be interested to see some of that in, in its own habitat. Now, I'm giving you your fish fix, okay? So there they are, <laughs> fish in the deep ocean. It is the invertebrates that are way more cool. There's no bones in this thing. This is a holotherian that we just happened upon swimming around in the currents. Just fantastically cool. This one is, you can see the anemone here, and can you see that this anemone is growing on a hermit crab? <laughs> this anemone is on this hermit crab that's standing up to spit at us. Fields and fields of urchins, right? This is uh, your sushi chef would be very excited about this place. This is all uni. <laughs> um, uh, the spines are to keep the stars off of them, by the way, because the stars will try to eat out the urchins. These are relatively rare down there, but we did see a few of them and managed to, when we did uh, chase them along, these uh, deep sea rays, just majestic creatures swimming down there. 
Um, uh, uh, this one it got followed for a very long time. Here's a sponge and a star. This is, I, I think, the sort of Seuss-like things that are down there. I just think that, that it was, must have been inspiring for him. Here's another example of that. This is a stocked crinoid trying to grow up, and up into the current a little bit more. Of course, I think you're noticing the crab that you see here. Please don't forget to see the invertebrate, right? To see the, uh, the Desmophyllum dianthus draped all around this thing. This crab is about 40 centimeters in diameter, absolutely huge. This is a carnivorous sea squirt. This one got a lot of play on CNN. Um, so this is like a Venus flytrap. It's trying to get things to swim into there so it can eat them. <laughs> it's not a nice place. Jason, by the way, would win in a fight with this one. Um, this one, and we know that because this one came home with us. Uh, this is a close-up of one of the corals, and I just, I like this one because you see all these little lines here? Those are the individual polyps on the whole colony that you see. This is another new species that we found down here, these barnacles. Each of those barnacles is about this tall. It's the same sort of thing that you see on the rocks when you go down to the beach, but much bigger. Here's a sea spider in, in close-up. It's, it's all leg, these sea spiders, and then you see these anemones in the background that unfortunately in the photographs look exactly like the dianthus. This, uh, the, uh, I'm amazed by this. So I hope, so this is, I, hopefully you're all looking at the coral right here, right? Good for you. <laughs> but there's an octopus back here in the back part of this. And I hope you see what the octopus has done. It's taken its legs and it's rolled up the ends and it's walking on them like feet. I have never seen something like this before. I, I, this, this was another good day an octopus walking on eight feet along on the bottom. The octopus was not very happy with us, hung out here for a bit. We finally scared it, and so it leapt off the rock, and instead of swimming in a way that I was expecting it to with pushing with its legs, it started gliding a little bit like a Starfleet cruiser here, right? That is as geeky as I mean it. <laughs> I watched a lot of Star Trek. Um, and I thought it was headed for this little cave that's down in here as it's sort of gracefully gliding through, but instead it decided to defend its territory, land, and give us the evil eye <laughs> and try to get us to leave. This is, makes it almost worth it to miss your family for Christmas and New Year's, <laughs> to be able to capture stuff. That you, you really have to pause for a moment and, and remind yourself that it's actually happening, right? That you're seeing this. This isn't Nova, right? This isn't, it, it, that we have stumbled across these creatures as you come here. So even I, who just want to get the corals, was amazed by some of this uh, life that we found down here. Okay, so we've noodled around in the middle for a little bit. How are we gonna build ourselves back up? Uh, what are we gonna do with all these corals that we have? Well, the classic thing that you do is you try to use the really good stratigraphy. So here's the top of the coral, it's relatively young. Here's the bottom of a coral, it's relatively old. And then we have to figure out something to do on the y-axis. In my field, we will do anything, right, that we think has something to do with climate. The color changed in the coral, excellent. Maybe that's related to some sort of climate change. The isotopic composition, the metal concentration, right, uh, anything that we can think of to do, we will try to measure. For our deep sea corals, uh, we have this advantage that as we look inside, inside of them, so here's a single coral with a penny for scale, and here now in, in a single septum of one of the coral is what the banding structure looks like. In a scanning electron microscope, in polarized light, and in transmitted light, each of these 100 microns or so. So now we're down at that very narrow part of the hourglass looking inside of these corals, trying to see if we can tease out any sort of climate information from them. I think you can see here that, we've, that the, there's very clear uh, crystal structure. These are uh, sea axes aligned aragonite needle bouquets and cross-polarized light. There's an optically dense center band where they grow from first, and so this is old and it move out towards younger over here. We have this great new microanalysis center here in, in GPS, in the, in the geology department. This is a fantastic new facility that's been set up thanks to some of the more money. And so now, so here is a millimeter, right, a thousand, this is, a, this is 1,600 microns along here. We're able to make measurements in our coral, geochemical measurements, that it, on a 20 micron spot size. There's actually even a machine in there that does it on about a 50 nanometer spot size, and we're still working that one out. And, and then the dark, the dark squares, that's the colored data. The dark squares are making a measurement on our regular way with a mass spectrometer, milling out some of the material, and we see that we're getting exactly the same answer 
And indeed, this center band is, has very high magnesium-calcium ratios. So that's neat, there's some sort of pattern lineup, but it is indicative of what has been one of the more frustrating, though all frustrating things become new problems, part of, of, of working on this. All of these y-axes that we've tried, except for two, all of these geochemical measurements, except for two, haven't worked. That we really have not been able to tease out climate information from them because they feel the banding in the coral much more than they actually feel the water. They feel the mineralization process that goes into making the, the coral skeleton and change according to that mineralization process much more than they change according to the water. They're not very good physical chemists <laughs> for re just recording the, the temperature or the, or the nutrient content or the circulation rate of the water in which they were growing. Instead, they're telling us something about how they put their skeletons together. Life gives you lemons, right? What do you do? You complain, right? No, make lemonade. And uh, so we've opened a whole new branch in our lab of trying to understand how is it the corals make their skeletons? What is that biomineralization process with the hope of trying to undo, to undo all those mineralization problems to get back at what was going on in the water? But in the interim, it's actually been fantastically cool to try and understand why these things are banded in the way that they do. However, two things have worked, one of them very recently, and this has come out of some fantastic new work that John Eiler has been developing over the last few years here at Caltech. He, he's been able to demonstrate that uh, the isotopic composition of calcium carbonate is a thermometer. Now, we actually knew that statement for a long time, but he's been able to show that there's a particular kind of thermometer that's much better than all the ones we've had before, and that is by looking at the two rare isotopes of carbon and oxygen, C13 and O18, and their ratio to the two abundant ones, C12 and O16. How much do the rare isotopes want to clump together compared to their uh, random distribution uh, in, in the more abundant isotopes? You make that ratio measurement here on a scale of parts per thousand, so this is seven parts in 10,000, 7.3 parts in 10,000, um, uh, uh, in the calcium carbonate, and it correlates very nicely with temperature. Here, plot is one on T squared, just to piss you off. Um, uh, and we have this fantastic thermometer that, that Nithya has worked out recently, working with me and John. And so we're excited, right? Because before this, we had one thing that worked until just about nine months ago. That's over about 12 years of research on these things. Um, that one thing that worked was the radiocarbon age. So here is a 15,400-year-old coral from the, uh, from the North Atlantic, where we cut off the bottom and measured its radiocarbon age, and cut out the middle and cut off the top and measured its radiocarbon age. And I hope you notice something here. The age at the bottom is younger than the age at the top. But it should be, from growth rate, its growth pattern, just exactly the other way around. This is because the age of the water that was bathing the coral has actually changed. So the coral was growing in relatively young water. That's water that has seen the surface relatively recently. And then by the time uh, 50 or 100 years later, the coral was growing in very old water. In other words, this young looking coral was a pattern much like the one that we see today in the ocean. And this top of the coral is much more like a pattern that we see here over the lifetime of the coral, which is only 50 to 100 years. So now we're starting to get back at that question. Are those rapid climate changes that we see in the ice core, are they showing up in our corals? And the answer is absolutely yes. We've seen a transition here over the, just the few decades that it took the coral to grow. In fact, we've gone around and collected a lot of these corals. You've seen how we've done some of that from the North Atlantic. And so here's 10,000 years ago and 26,000 years ago. The last glacial maximum sits right in here. And then the warm part here of the Holocene is back over on this side. And this is like a little movie, a strip movie, standing on the mid-ocean ridge in the Atlantic, standing in the North Atlantic at about the latitude of New York and looking across to New York at 40 degrees or so. And from 1,500 meters down to 4,500 meters deep, trying to see what did the age of the water look like. At the last glacial maximum, the deep waters were very, very old. It had been a long, it had been, uh, they were about 30% depleted in their radiocarbon content relative to the atmosphere. You then come in through this termination, through the deglaciation. So now you're starting to lose the ice in the northern hemisphere. We're in one of those rapid warming times that we've been looking at before. And the deep ocean very rapidly gets ventilated by relatively young water. It goes back to old water and then comes back to young, looking much more like the case that we see today. 
Because we're able to capture individual events within single corals, we know that some of these changes are incredibly, incredibly rapid over just a few decades that are probably have to do with fronts moving back and forth uh, laterally rather than, uh, than vertically. These rapid climate changes that we've seen in the ice cores are indeed showing up in the deep ocean. The deep ocean is part and parcel of the physics of this uh, part of the climate system. This is the last scientific slide I, I, I'm gonna show you, and it's another example of how if you go out and look, new things will come to you in, in a way that you never really expect. So this is the same sort of diagram I showed you before, but no chemical information here at all. I'm not trying to show you the radiocarbon content of the water or show you its temperature with funny clumped isotopes or anything like that. Every dot that you see here is just the age of a coral, a coral that, that we picked up at 2,000 meters and its age came out at 30,000 years, goes in as a single dot that you see here. I could have imagined a couple different ways that this plot would have turned out. All the dots would have been here and they would have sort of been a wash to fewer and fewer as we went out that way. That would have been a preservation effect that we have the same amount of coral, the same amount of number of corals being produced. The community is constant in time, but the skeletons dissolve on the seafloor uh, eventually. And so we'd see the more recent ones and they would fall away in time. Another possibility that we might have seen here is that there would be more in the surface ocean because there's more of their food supply there, there's more of the reigning organic carbon, and fewer down here, there'd be kind of a wash from uh, surface to deep. I, I hope you realize that there, that's not the case, for neither of those is the case. There is, in fact, they hate the Holocene. <laughs> they do not grow in the last 10,000 years, except in the shallowest waters, but they came back in the Little Ice Age. This is a few hundred years ago, the age that, that corresponds here. Um, and having been gone for 10,000 years, they suddenly came back in the Little Ice Age. The community loves these rapid climate changes during the deglaciation, this is the Younger Dryas and Heinrich Event One, these things that get named. During the last glacial maximum, they went into some sort of refugia here, and in the glacial period itself, the community was doing really well. Forget doing the chemistry, the tracer geochemistry, or the tracer oceanography from trying to measure their skeletons, the population itself is feeling these rapid climate changes how the animals, the community of animals are moving in space and time is being paced by the climate changes 2,000 meters above them, right? It's an, a blow me away sort of example of just how linked the deep ocean is with, with the atmosphere and we're trying very hard to try and understand who changes first and, and why. This is the group that, that, that's trying to do that. This is part of the, of the scientific team out at sea a couple months ago. And if you see any of them in the audience, uh, introduce yourself and, and say thanks. I'll say thanks to you for listening and be happy to take questions afterwards up here at the table. Thanks very much. Thank you.